Good morning. Welcome to session three of five on myth busting the Second Vatican Council, the 21st Ecumenical Council of the Church that happened in the early 1960s. We're happy to have you with us this morning. Let's get started today with a prayer, and I, I want to pray a prayer specifically for Christian unity, which is one of the big themes of the Council, and especially one that today's document is concerned with. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gracious Lord, we ask you to behold this, your family, for whom your Son was willing to go even to the cross and to be sacrificed for sinners. We ask that in his name and through the power of his Spirit, you would unite all of us one to each other, even to those who are outside the visible boundaries of the church. All this we ask for his sake, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, folks, so if you were with us uh, from the beginning, you know that we started with a bit of historical background on the council. Why did it happen? Who were the major players? What were the major themes and ideas? We did that at the first. Uh, we did last week, we began our study of the church's four constitutions, the big four. There were 16 documents in the council, but these are kind of the big four that kind of constitute and make plain all that comes next. So last week we did Dave Verbum on Divine Revelation, a bit on the Bible and a bit on Jesus Christ himself. If you um, missed any of these sessions, we're putting them all up on YouTube. So just go to our YouTube page, St. Teresa. Uh, get on YouTube and type St. Teresa Austin and it will come right up. But today we're going to do the Constitution Lumen Gentium, which is about the church. And um, the question that we're going to ask is, what is the church? When you approach a document like this for the first time, I think the first question you should just ask is, what does the text say? Um, but I think the second one that you should ask when you read Lumen Gentium is, what is the church? Uh, Lumen Gentium just means, of course, the light to the Gentiles. And we'll explain what that means in due course. But first, we're going to play a little game akin to the one that we played last time. So two of these are true. One of these is false. Don't tell me your answer right now, but just kind of have them in the back of your mind as we go, and then by the end, you'll be able to answer the question for yourself. Two of these are true. One of these are false, according to Lumen Gentium. Number one, Protestants, Muslims, Jews, and even people who don't know God can go to heaven. Number two, since elements of sanctification, that is, ways of becoming holy, are present outside the church, people aren't obligated to enter it. Or number three, there are some people who cannot be saved. Two of those are true, one of them is false. On we go. Why Lumen Gentium? In paragraph one, the council tells us, because Christ is the light of the nations. And because this is so, the sacred synod gathered together in the Holy Spirit eagerly desires, by proclaiming the gospel to every creature, to bring the light of Christ to all men a light brightly visible on the countenance of the church. So if you've been here since the beginning, you know that this council has a kind of missionary bent. We're worried that folks in the modern world don't understand what the church is about, what her mission is. We're going to restate it all and invite the whole world to participate in it. But we see here that the church is conceived of as sort of like a sacrament for the world. Um, it's reflecting the light of Jesus. So um, the church, right, like the institution, the hierarchy is not the light of the nations, but Jesus is the light of the nations. And the church, like a lighthouse, gets to reflect that out into the world. The church gets to say um, to all those seafarers, right, here's where the rocks are, here's where you might run aground, here's where a safe harbor is, right? And we're doing this all because of the nature of our relationship with Jesus. That's how we understand our ability to say, here are the rocks, here's the harbor, pay attention, that kind of a thing. Reflecting the light of Jesus like a sacrament into the world. The mystery of the church is next touched upon. So when you're reading theological texts and you hear something described as a mystery, you shouldn't think like Scooby-Doo <laughs> or you shouldn't think uh, Sherlock Holmes. You shouldn't think true crime. That's not the idea. Uh, when the church uses the word mystery, she's referring to something that God is in the process of unfolding, a secret that God is in the process of of disclosing. God's like peeling back the curtain slowly on something and giving us a window into the divine life. Already from the beginning of the world, the foreshadowing of the church took place. And it's important for us to know that the church was not God's plan B, right? It was not God's plan B to, to create this family and constitute it and make it the means by which God would save the world. 
If you ever, um, if you ever do a deep dive into the book of Genesis, you see that the Garden of Eden is described with uh, temple or tabernacle imagery. The idea being that God intended this place to be a kind of divine sanctuary, uh, a place wherein he could communicate perfectly and have perfect friendship with his creation. And the Holy Spirit is the, the one who hooks us into this divine life. And hooks is not a coinage of the council. It's my, my personal gloss on the thing. But you can imagine an angler, right? You can imagine somebody casting out their line, trying to hook something and then reel it in. The Holy Spirit is that for us. Somebody who is slowly pulling us in to the life of God. While it slowly grows, the church strains toward the completed kingdom. And there the image of, of the fish is, 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 is good, right? So sometimes a fish will strain toward you and sometimes a fish will strain away from you. But the church is working, right, to get to a particular place. It's described in a variety of metaphors, all of which are taken straight from the scriptures. So Jesus is like a king and we're his subjects. He's like a shepherd, we're his sheep. He's like a vineyard owner, we're like his workers. He's like the foundation of a house, we're like the room or the rooms or the scaffolding. He's like a mother who cares for us, his children. We're like a bride being married to him the husband. So these are all ways that the church is described in the scripture, um, describing the ways in which our union with Jesus is strengthened through the sacraments. The sacraments are like the delivery vehicles of God's grace. The church in heaven and on earth and in the institution itself is described as being one. That is to say there aren't three churches or four churches, right? There's not the church in purgatory, or the church on earth, or the church in heaven, or the church in its like visible institution, but these are all one entity, the body of Christ extended throughout time and space. This church, constituted and organized in the world as a society, subsists, lives in the Catholic Church, governed by the successor of Peter and bishops in communion and with him, though many elements of sanctification and truth are found outside its visible structure. So, Many elements of sanctification and truth, many ways of getting holy, and many true things about the world are discoverable outside the church, which is important for us to keep in mind. So um, when we hear of Muslims adoring the one God, right, or adoring the one God who will appear as, as judge at the end of days, or when we hear that Protestants are like, like devoting themselves intently to the study of the scriptures, or when we hear about um, a scientist who his whole life has been an atheist, but he just sort of goes, you know what? There seem to be like patterns here in nature. There seem to be laws according to which the universe is governed. How can that happen unless there were a lawgiver, right? A pattern maker, that kind of thing. When these elements of sanctification and truth are discovered outside the church, she celebrates it. Why? Because these are forces, we say, that are impelling people towards Catholic unity. This is the Holy Spirit sort of casting his line and trying to reel people in when they discover these things that are true and good and beautiful outside of our visible confines. Chapter 2 talks to us about the people of God. God doesn't save us merely as individuals, but brings us into his covenant family, the church. And God makes us a kingdom of priests, ministerial and royal or lay and ordained. So the Catholic conception of salvation or uh, coming into the church is not just like me and my Bible and JC and we're good to go. You know, I can just sit under an apple tree, meditate on the scriptures, and this is the extent of my um, participation in the divine life. We say that when God saves people, he calls them into a society, into a family, into a thing called the church, not merely as individuals. So the church in this conception is not like... Um, Jiffy loop, right? Like if I know how to change my oil itself, myself, I'll just stay home kind of a thing. Like no, it's, it's, it's not a voluntary association. It's a divine society. Many nations, but one people of God. Taking its citizens from every race, making them citizens of a kingdom which is of a heavenly rather than of an earthly nature. It fosters and takes to itself the ability and riches and customs in which the genius of each people expresses itself. It purifies, strengthens, elevates, and ennobles them. Lovely text. Uh, we talked last time about how when God wants to empower someone to do a particular heroic, 
a, a heroic, virtuous, supernatural deed. He doesn't destroy their nature or their personality or their personhood in order to accomplish this. Grace doesn't destroy human nature. It perfects it. So when the church is evangelizing a brand new culture, like the end game is not colonialism. The end game is not to make them like, and now we're going to make them like, okay, they accepted Jesus, and now we're going to make them Italian. Okay? <laughs> they accepted Jesus, and now we're going to make Americans out of them. Like, that's not the idea at all. The church wants the best of their culture, the best of their art and music and architecture and philosophy and poetry to graft that into this great tree, right? That's the idea. So if you've ever been to, like, the Maronite church, um, uh, the, the friends, our friends, friends of ours over down near Airport Boulevard, like, they're, lit- they're a Catholic church, right? They're called Maronites, but their liturgy stems from Aramaic and Arabic roots. So if you go there, it feels very Middle Eastern, right? It doesn't feel Latin or Western or anything like that. The church, in evangelizing to these people, did not say, and you've got to become American at the end of this for this to all work out, right? Like, the church wants the best of every culture to graft it in to itself. Okay, I, I always want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, I always want to share a little bit of why these texts are so important to me. And I hinted at this, uh, I think, two weeks ago, but um, when I was about 90% sure that the church um, was, what, was what it claimed to be, when I was sure that I needed to become Catholic myself, I went to a friend of mine, um, PhD in systematic theology, um, big, big mover and shaker in the Anglican world, and I said, hey, man, I'm thinking about making this move. Um, can you talk me out of it? Right? Can we? And he said, yeah, let's sit down and discuss the Vatican II text together. And so we got to this point, um, number 14, paragraph 14 in Lumen Gentium, and this just hit me like a punch in the gut, but in, the, in, the, in really the most beautiful and lovely way. Christ himself affirmed the necessity of the church, for through baptism as through a door, men enter it. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or remain in it, could not be saved. And I said, oh bleep, you know, that's me. (laughs) Like, I'm the person that they're describing here. I have a choice to make now. I believe this stuff. I no longer have the option to just sort of remain aloof and disconnected from this. Um... You can think of biblical analogies if you want to. So like somebody who hears that the flood is coming but refuses to get onto Noah's Ark, right? You can think of another biblical analogy. You can think of um, the Israelites being saved initially out of Egypt and then refusing to enter the promised land. You can think about as somebody who is, um, you know, uh, 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 contemplating a move and about to make a move to the Pacific Northwest. You can think about uh, uh, Mount St. Helens, 25 30 years ago, whenever that was, those people were told um, for weeks and months leading up to the eruption, the mountain's going to blow up. You've got to get out of here. You have to leave if you want to survive. Most of them did. A couple of them didn't. I don't know why. Right? They're not around anymore. I can't ask them why they didn't leave. Okay? But there's some sort of analogy here wherein somebody knows the truth, decides not to do anything with it, and has to pay the consequences with that. And I knew, upon reading Lumen Gentium 14, that if I didn't make a move, that would be me. I'd be under the rubble. It doesn't let the rest of us off the hook either, though, even the ones who initially respond and join the church. He is not saved who, though part of the body of the church, does not persevere in charity. And this is doing nothing more than echoing the sentiments of Jesus and St. Paul numerous times in the scriptures. Jesus will say to his disciples, You'll be hated by all for the sake of my name, but the one who endures, perseveres to the end, that one will be saved. Um, He'll say in the book of Revelation, To those who conquer, these will will I allow to sit on my Father's throne. The ones who conquer will receive the white stone and the name that no one can take away. Right? who doesn't persevere in charity. Yeah, uh, uh, St. Paul will also say, you believe in Jesus, do you? Well, so do the demons, <laughs> right? The, che- the demons believe and they shudder. What good is it if it's not perfected in love? What good is it if it's not perfected in charity? What good is it your faith if it doesn't have good works to accompany it? That kind of thing. And the church, church's children should remember not to get a big head about themselves, Right? should remember their exalted status is to be attributed not to their own merits. Like, it's not because you're so cool or special or interesting or holy that you're Catholic, right? It's not because you're so cool or special or interesting or holy that God saved you. It's the extent to which you cooperated with God's grace, the extent to which you cooperated with these special merits that are Christ's. Um, 
This is about Protestants, which is super cool. The church, and, and, and this really sounded my alarm bells too once upon a time, the church is linked with those who, being baptized, are honored with the name of Christian, though they do not profess the faith in its entirety. In all of Christ's disciples, the Spirit arouses the desire to be peacefully united. Mother Church never ceases to pray, hope, and work that this might come about. Um, this is a, this is a, a, I, I shouldn't call him a buddy because I feel like that's disrespectful given who he, who he is, but we've corresponded a few times. Uh, the fellow kneeling is Michael Nazir Ali. He was the um, bishop in the Church of England in Rochester who was one of the five, I think, who converted to the Catholic Church in 2020 and 2021. Um, you know, about the highest position you could be in the Church of England. And he said, I'm giving it all up. I have to go and be Catholic. I have, to, I have to do this. This is the church Jesus founded. I have no choice sort of thing. So Mother Church never ceases to pray, hope, and work. This might come about. We prayed for it here at the beginning. We hope for it in that the things that God promises, he doesn't renege on. He doesn't um, take back. He doesn't take back his promises. And we... Um, we work that this might come about. We talk about this in public, and we do the work of apologetics. Right. Does that apply equally to folks who fall away from the church? We'll get there. Um, so chapter 2 also talks about those who have not yet received the gospel but can be saved. And this is really, really heartening. Uh, Jews. This people remains most dear to God who does not repent of the gifts he makes nor of the calls he issues. About Muslims, the salvation of those also includes those who, professing to hold the faith of Abraham along with us, adore the one and merciful God, who on the last day will judge mankind. And seekers, those who, through no fault of their own, do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, yet sincerely seek God and, moved by grace, strive by their deeds to do his will as it's known to them through the dictates of conscience. So I always used to worry about this because my church had no clear answer for how this worked, right? But if there's like some remote tribe in the Amazon that's never read the Bible, never heard the gospel, never met a Christian, like what happens to them, right? On the last day, are they just kind of totally doomed because they never had the opportunity to respond to God's grace? And the church here echoes the thought of St. John Henry Newman, who called the conscience the aboriginal vicar of Christ in the soul. So before you know God by special revelation, before you know him by the self-disclosure of his son, you're able to know him in a mysterious way through the conscience. This is why, even in these remote tribes, there's a sense of like general morality that we recognize and celebrate. Like People generally know... Okay, it's like bad to murder, <laughs> and it's bad to steal, and it's good to be charitable, right? Like the extent to which they cooperate with those basic human virtues is the extent to which they can be saved, which is really, a, really a remarkable thing. None of this lets us off the hook for evangelism. It's not as if we can just say, oh, well, they're good, you know, because the Lumen Gentium says it's possible for them to be saved. We want that can to move to will, right? We want that, that can to move to should. We want that can to move to, like, how can we cooperate with God's grace such that these people can hear the truth in its entirety? The stuff on the laity is really cool, too. What specifically characterizes the laity, that is, people who aren't ordained, is their secular nature. They seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs, working for the sanctification of the world from within as a leaven. In this way, they make Christ known to others. So, uh, it, uh, like a priest or a bishop or a deacon, like knows pretty well what it means to be a Christian in their vocation. It's, it's, the job description is quite descript. It sets all of that out for them. You've got to say mass. You've got to go visit the poor. You have to, to administrate this or that in the diocese. Like, it's all kind of neatly laid out for them. What's not laid out, and this is what makes being a lay Christian so like exciting and engaging and interesting, is like the church doesn't tell you, here's how you become a, uh, a Christian pest control person. Here's how you become a Christian lawyer. Here's how you become a Christian pizza maker. Like here's how you become a baker, candlestick maker, whatever, whatever it is, right? Whatever it is you do, the church doesn't have this pres uh, specifically prescribed out. You, cooperating with the Holy Spirit in your life, get to experiment and improvise and discover what it means to be a Christian in all of these fields, which is very cool. All these, the laity's ordinary works, become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. Together with the offering of the Lord's body, they are most fittingly offered in the celebration of the Eucharist. 
Thus the laity consecrate the world itself to God. Man, that's special. So when the priest in the Mass says, um, uh, Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God the Almighty Father, the period before that is the offertory. And during the offertory, you can do what I'm tempted to do sometimes, which is just sort of like dumbly look around at where the plate's going and like dumbly look up at the altar and see who's doing the dishes, right? Or you can be doing what Lumen Gentium describes, which is to consecrate the world itself to God. How do we do that? During that period where all that's being set up, we can be making sacrifices and offerings ourselves through prayer. God, um, my, I have a sister who is very far from the Lord. I want to offer you her soul today in the Eucharist. I have a coworker who I know out is, is strung out on drugs all the time. It really affects his performance. I know he's going down a dark road. We're really concerned about him. I want to lift you up his recovery today. I want to offer you his recovery. Uh, Lord, I have this new job opportunity coming up. It sounds really exciting and interesting. I'm not sure how it's going to affect my family. Let me offer that up to you right now. So instead of just washing people do the dishes, you're getting ready to make your own sacrifices of prayer. That way when the priest says, it's time to do the sacrifice, you're like, yeah, I'm ready. I have something to offer. I have something to say. You consecrate the world itself to God. Let the laity, by their combined efforts, remedy the customs and conditions of the world, that all may be conformed to the norms of justice. The faithful should learn how to distinguish carefully between those rights and duties which are theirs as members of the church and those which they have as members of human society. Let them strive to reconcile the two, since even in secular business there is no human activity which can be withdrawn from God's dominion. Especially important for Americans to keep in mind who are afflicted with a certain kind of pragmatism, right? A certain kind of fragmentation that threatens to um, impinge upon every area of our lives. Well, business ethics are over here, right? And um, sort of Christian ethics are over here, and my private life is over here, and uh, my hobbies are over here. Like, these all operate according to different rules and regulations and things like that. The church says, no, no, your, your, your obligations, your duties as a citizen of the kingdom of God require you to try and integrate these spheres whenever you can. These nuns who were marching for, for civil rights could have stayed home, right? These people who were going out to the March for Life could have stayed home. The reason they go and the reason they work and the reason that all of us are striving to bring all of human activity under the realm of God's dominion is because we know that his ways ultimately are better. We know that God's the society God wants to build is more just, right? So we have to involve ourselves at the forefront of these social issues. Reconciling the two, like our obligations as members of the church, our obligations as members of society. Um, lots of nuns playing basketball in Lumen Gentium. Talks, to, like, talks to the, about that all the time. The profession of the evangelical councils. The evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience, right? If you're going to volunteer to be a religious brother or sister, a monk or nun, you have to, in various forms, sign up for poverty, sign up for chastity, sign up for obedience. The profession of these, then, appears as a sign which can and ought to attract all the members of the church because the people of God have no lasting city here below. So they're a sign for us when, we, when they go about living their lives and we remember, like they demonstrate to us, oh yeah, like life is not all about getting money because money's all going to pass away. Look how these people demonstrate this. Um, life is not all about securing power because power is going to pass away. Life is not all about securing like sex and, and, and children and family life because all of that's going to pass away, right? By their renunciation of these values, even though those values are good in some measure to some degree, they don't detract from a genuine development of human persons, but rather by its very nature, that which is most beneficial to the development. Let no one think that the religious have become strangers to their fellow men or useless citizens of this earthly city by their consecration. I don't know if anybody's been to Clear Creek Abbey in Oklahoma, the Benedictine monastery up there. It's about uh, six or seven hours away from here by car. I went with some friends up there last spring, and it's really remarkable. It's a, it's a bustling monastery. There's about 50 brothers who are in there praying the offices every day. Everything's chanted and everything's in Latin. So I didn't hear anything like spoken or in English until I was, you know, uh, uh, like eating lunch with them or something like that. Um, let no one think that they're useless citizens of this earthly city by their consecration. They're a little socially strange, 
right? <laughs> you can't just like go up to them and ask them what they thought about the Super Bowl. They probably didn't know that the Super Bowl was going on, right? This is long past out of, out of the day-to-day -day, uh, life of their minds. Their existence, though, is not as somebody who's useless or somebody who's like so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good, but they're witnesses to us. They're signs to us uh, of a future and better world that's coming. Uh, eschatological nature of the church. Eschatological just means like the end times. Uh, there's a great section in here talking about the saints and devotion to the saints. Basically, it says we love the saints and we should depend on them for, uh, for prayers. But authentic devotion to them doesn't primarily consist in the multiplying of external acts. So we don't love the saints because they are like occasionally perform miracles for us. You see in the Gospels, like Jesus kind of getting visibly annoyed because he's like, all these people want are miracles. Like all they want are signs. They just want to show, right? It's not that the miracles are bad. In fact, when they happen, we should celebrate them and get really excited about them. But true devotion to the saints is marked by the extent to which we're growing in the intensity of our love. The saints show us how to love God and love humanity. Like, that's how we know we have good devotion to the saints. Instead of, oh, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that miracle or whatever? Right? Like, the love is the most important part. Oh, man. I wish I didn't have to go through it so fast through Mary here. But... Um, Mary is, you might, you, might, you might wonder, like, why is a chapter on Mary appended to the end of this document on the church? Like, shouldn't she get her own or shouldn't she be in a different place? Well, um, being the mother of God and preeminent church member, she's the type of faith and worthy are of, of our affections, the document says. So the type of faith, um, it means that, like, when the church is working properly, when the church is doing what she's supposed to do, the church looks a lot like Mary. That's the idea. She's sort of like the prototype, uh, the archetype, the preeminent church member. Um, good, uh, the, the church fulfilling its mission looks like Mary, somebody who, um, though they didn't know the full ex picture and the full extent of God's plan, nonetheless gave their full and enthusiastic consent to the mission to which they were being called. So she's called um, with, with Eve's old titles, right? The mother, the living, the new Eve, the queen of the universe. And surprising, maybe to some Catholics, Jesus is, is, is described as the ultimate mediator and Mary being his subordinate, not his equal. Um, maybe that's not a problem here, but you, you, can, you can see how it could be a problem in some places. Proper Marian devotion points us to Jesus, and the church says that we should abstain zealously from all gross exaggerations, as well as from petty narrow-mindedness and considering the singular dignity of the mother of God. So the petty narrow minder petty narrow mindedness is like the Protestant error. Oh, she's just a woman. Oh, she's just a girl. She was just a teenage girl. Like she just said, yeah, like she was Jesus's mom. It's no big deal. Don't make such a big fuss about Mary. Um, the growth exaggerations are sort of like the Catholic error, like knocking on the Pope's door and demanding he declare Mary the mediatrix of all graces or I'm going to scream and rip out my hair sort of a thing. Like Abstain from the gross exaggerations, abstain from the downplaying, and recognize that uh, devotion to Mary is good and we should, it should be rightly ordered. But just like the religious are assigned to us of the life of the world to come, so Mary is a sign of created hope and solace to the wandering people of God, the wayfarers, and a picture of the church as it shall be. So, if you were keeping, if you were keeping count there, you'll notice that I did not talk about chapter 3, church structure in the episcopate, and I didn't talk about the universal call to holiness. Um, those are both really good chapters. I just felt that, like, for this group, you'll probably understand a kind of basic outline of that, so I tried to cover the parts that I thought were helpful for this group. But please go and read them. Um, just for the sake of time here, I didn't, I didn't dive into those. Are we able to answer the two truths and a lie here after the talk? Well, that's tough. I would have said three is false, but it sounds like if you're in the church and you say, I don't want to belong to this, even though I know it's true, and the, the council says, well, you can't be saved. So that would make, I mean, two would be the false one. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. right. Yeah. John, you're two for two here. One, one last week, one, one this week. That's, that's very good. Um, yeah, the people who can't like, it, it's very specific, isn't it? Um, you, you would think that the church might, uh, might be a little bit more broad in this, but the people who can't be saved are those who, knowing what the church is, right, would refuse to enter or remain in it. Um, the, the example of Noah's Ark is kind of the typical one. If you, if you refuse the offer of salvation, right, what more can be done for you sort of a thing? Um, 
It doesn't let us off the hook for evangelism. In fact, it encourages it. Um, and it especially should impel us towards those brothers and sisters of ours who, who have, for, for whatever reason, have fallen off or kind of gotten a taste of the church and gone away or whatever. Uh, I knew for me personally, when I encountered that paragraph, I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> it's talking about me. Like, I am now liable for this information. I have to make the jump. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any comments or questions um, or things they want to say about today? Well, I, my only comment is that this, when it came out, just made so much sense to me because if God, you know, there was this thing in the past where priests would say there's no salvation without the Catholic Church. And, and I'm thinking, well, God created billions of, of humans over the millennia. Is he going to cast all of them to hell because they're not Catholic? And so this really made sense to me and opened up a lot of, a lot of good things. Well, here's, here, and here's what's tricky about this. Like, it's still true that there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church. That's still the case. So what they say about seekers or Muslims or Jews or whatever is the extent to which they cooperate with those Catholic gifts that can be found. Like, those are still Catholic things, right? Elements of Catholic truth and sanctification. If they can be found outside the church, and the extent to which the people cooperate with them is the extent to which they can be saved. So it's not as if they, like found a, a box of buried treasure of God's secret revelation somewhere else, and that's what got him in. Like, what they found was something Catholic scattered out there in the world. Um, Justin Martyr will call it a logo spermaticos, a seed of the word that was present somewhere else in creation that somebody discovered. So, Ryan, a question. Yes, sir. So if you did not convert knowing what you knew, would you not have been saved? I do, yeah, that, that, is, that is what the document is, is saying. Yeah. Yeah, and I knew that, right? That just, that just got to me. But what about your friend, the one you consulted? Yeah, right. They, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I asked him that question, like theological PhD, very advanced fellow in this sort of stuff. I said, so buddy, you're telling me that you really believe that the fullness of the grace of Jesus is present in the Catholic Church and that you don't feel compelled then to enter it. And he goes, well, let me get back to you about that. I'm going to have to think about that. And I, I could tell it wasn't like, I could tell it wasn't a punt. I, can tell it, I could tell it wasn't like a get out of jail free card. He was really going to spend some time um, thinking about that question. And uh, I need to follow up with him and see where he is there. Ron, thank you very much. Two things came to mind. First of all, certain play in the words. There are you know, play in the words with regard to scripture. There's play in the words with regard to documents. I'm not so much wanting to go into the extent of proclaiming the words. I'm wanting to ask about how these words were decided upon, the process by which, and I've, heard, I've read various things about this, and I thought maybe for another time you could comment on what you would understand how these texts were decided and who was the most influential uh, in that kind of process. In, in term, like you say the, the play on the words. Um, you mean like the specific vocabulary that they're using and how they chose? That is one element. Yeah. Uh, we've talked here about uh, being saved. Yeah. And I was thinking about people that I've known that have had very difficult experiences within the Catholic Church. For example, someone who is into a religious order and then I suspect got exposed to some things that were just, they were not gospel oriented. All. He rejected that, and then in the process, he, he moved away from the faith. How much of the, I understand you know, there are subjective elements in these things, but the play in the words is, is uh, also oriented toward, there, there's been issues with regard to ambiguity, too. Yeah, I might, I might answer that. Um, I might try to an, an, an answer that um, with fear and trepidation, with an analogy to um, suicide. Um, I, the, the church has said, says this in the catechism, we recognize that there's a certain lack of right-mindedness that happens in a person who's going to take their own life. Like, we don't know the extent to which they're responsible 
or the extent to which we, they understand. Like, if they were in their right minds, wouldn't they have made that decision? Like, the answer, the answer is almost certainly no, right? Like, so to what extent are they accountable for this knowledge that we thought they knew, we thought they understood, if they're going to make that decision, right? So, I, I, I'm, I might very carefully and very gently just say, you know, for, for those who have experienced some sort of severe abuse and decided to jump ship, like, were all the facts known? Were they capable of understanding the facts, right? All, all of that is, all of that weighs into that, to that decision. I'll throw up a few names in this regard. For example, one of the people that I know who's a PhD and very knowledgeable was mentioning that Hans Urs von Balthasar was probably the most influential intellectual to contribute to the documents of the Vatican II. And then I've heard other people who were most influential. And then I've heard criticisms of the backgrounds of these people and how it influenced the texts. So that's where I also I was going to. That's where I was, what I was trying to drive at when I was talking about playing the work. Yeah, absolutely. So if you if you want a great list of like all the the um, the, the movers and shakers of Vatican II, uh, Bishop Barron's book, he ha the Vatican II put out um, one on the constitutions and one on the de decrees and declarations. And the one on the constitution, there's a, there's a glossary in the back that has like every major figure and movement and like different parties, right? That the church organized according to this people, these people wanted this in there, these people didn't and all of that. So he, he lists them, those all out very helpfully. That's where I would uh, direct you. Can you put the church false questions back up? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, the three are those who, knowing the church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or remain in it. And so the Protestants, Jews, and Muslims, and people who are seeking, don't know that the church was made necessary by Christ. They're missing that essential component. When you say the church, you mean Catholicism? Right, the Catholic Church. So yeah. Protestant Jews and Muslims who aren't enlightened enough can be saved until they're enlightened, and then they can't. Um, it, it, the extent to which they and, and this is, I mean, that, that sounds like so Jesus doesn't use the Jesus never talks about Protestants and Jews, like he doesn't have that vocabulary right, um, but he'll uh, like the, the Hebrews will say how, how, can, how can somebody be saved who like neglects the heavenly gift having tasted of it, right it's, it's, that, it's that kind of a thing, once they know they're accountable for what, for what they know um, and, and this, this is true in our Legal, legal system today, like they're harsher, and the, the penalties are harsher for people who, like, do something with full consent and full cooperation and things like that. All right, folks, thank you so much for your time. Come back next week.